First, Rishi Singh. Uh, he's professor of ophthalmology at the Cole Eye Institute, which is part of Cleveland Clinic, and everybody in Retina knows Rishi. Uh, Jill Hopkins, senior vice president and global head of ophthalmology development at Novartis. And finally, my old friend, Daniela Ferrara, senior medical director, global development lead in retinal diseases, ophthalmology personalized healthcare program and product development at Genentech. Daniela, my only comment is uh, your uh, business card must be like double size because that's the biggest title I've ever I'll seen. I'll take it. <laughs> so uh, as one who's never been afraid to ask the dumb question, I'm going to start out, Daniela, by asking you, what's the difference between AI and machine learning and do we care? <laughs> we should care for a few reasons, but as a clinician, I can tell you that machine learning is a subfield of artificial intelligence, which per se has been around for 50 years. But machine learning, in essence, uses uh, statistical models to analyze, interpret complex data, learn from it, and then make statistical decisions of what could be the possible best outcome for a given question. Um, Deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that, uh, in essence, the algorithms are organized in layers, the so-called uh, convolution neural networks, that aims to uh, mimic the thinking flow of the human brain. And in essence, what happens is deep learning is so much more powerful because it can adapt as new data comes up and can start thinking on its own and hence, that's the power of deep learning. And as a clinician, I'm slightly overwhelmed by the power of deep learning, but I think we should care because we're moving towards from machine learning that's in essence more interpretable. Again, it's a, a subfield that comes from pattern recognition from AI. We, we all retina specialists love pattern recognition. So I'm fairly comfortable with machine learning at this point. Now we have to move towards deep learning to truly come to groundbreaking medical advances because at some point we need to see beyond what we all can see and interpret the data that we all can interpret and we just need to, how to handle all of that. Yeah. So to, to layer it, if you got a group of retina specialists to look at OCTs, we could all agree that they were abnormal. If you get a machine to do it, you can do it faster and better. But then what we really want is the machine to show us things that we just couldn't see or put together. Is that? That's enough. Now, exactly. so what do you need? If I want to start a company that's going to do deep learning and ophthalmology, what do I need to do it? I think Nama laid out so uh, beautifully. You need a lot of data, but you need good data. Is what you uh, has yes. been calling meaningful data at scale. It's not, if it's trashing, it's gonna be trash out. Yep. You need to know the data, you need ground truth that you can trust. So, so isn't that the real challenge? I mean, I, I work in Boston, you can throw a rock across the Charles River and hit somebody at MIT that could do a deep learning program for you. So that's not the problem. Isn't it in essence, finding that data set? So Rishi, you work at a, a reading center and you're an active clinician. Yep. How do you approach that problem of the ground truth? So what my, a lot of my work actually is in our, my research lab, which is a center for ophthalmic bioinformatics. And what we've been doing is curating data for the past 10 years with the hope of artificial intelligence and deep learning models being able to utilize our data in more meaningful ways, in a clean way that I think we lack right now, as you pointed out. I mean, if you look at things like the IRIS database, as an example, mm -hmm. people always point to that as a great leap forward. But when you look at some of the data and really get into the details, it misses a lot of the biometric data of patients, hemoglobin A1C, renal mm -hmm. status, other comorbidities that would might predict modeling. So if you really want to develop the all-inclusive model um, and make it as, as potentially patient-centric as possible, you have to have good data, as they, they were mentioning, but you have to have data that's obviously categorized, curated, and kept for a long period of time. And that's really, I think, where the power of, of, of data sets come in. And there are some data sets beyond ours that, is, that are really quite good, but there's a, a lack of, I think, standardization amongst those data sets, which leads to that problem. Yeah, I think that there is some ignorance at one level that yeah. every ophthalmologist agrees what moderate background diabetic retinopathy is. So if it says that in the chart, right. that's, that's a ground truth. Uh, so your data set, and Jill, your data set has to be very different. You've got this wonderful groups of data sets from these very large trials that have been performed, and you've got really robust data, but isn't that problem that you just have those people who signed up for those studies? And so how do you deal with going from this 
very well curated data set, but, uh, but only a very select people to make it robust across the entire world. Right, it's a great question. I want to commend you on the fabulous speakers, and I think the efforts that, that everyone who spoke today have put into trying to solve some of these problems are just monumental. We still have a long way to go, but I think it's interesting. When we think about the clinical trial data, so those beautiful phase threes that you follow patients for two years with monthly imaging, I mean, those are gold in terms of mm -hmm. building a model on. And I think what's been great is across the industry, whether it's Hawk and Harry or Lampolizumab, there's been a lot of work done with that with some of the tech companies and others to develop algorithms. So I think that's really exciting. You're right though, that then you have a really nice model that doesn't at all potentially mirror what happens in the real world. So then you get into the big question of validation and that's where you know we work at a regulated landscape. I think Kashal, you nicely outlined <laughs> prospective, retrospective, how much do I need? Do I have to test my algorithm against seven other algorithms to show that it's good? And we don't really have standards in the way, you know, we don't expect to test our drug against seven other drugs out there that may not have even had the validation to get the algorithm there to match the one you did, right? So that sort of standards, standardization at that level, I think is challenging. So I think we honestly have to come together and you say, what, what do we need? To me, it's collaboration. So is it, is it tech? Is it clinical? Is it pharma? How do we come together, imaging companies, all of us, at the table, different complementary skills, but collaborating in a way that will yeah. actually move this forward? So that's the problem is who owns the algorithm and who owns the data. Mm -hmm. And so uh, before I go into that, I, I do want to ask you, how are you using it in drug development at Novartis right now? How are you using AI? Yeah, so we're using it in a host of ways. I would say, you know, I think the one we mentioned, the sort of clinical um, trial algorithms to, to drive, hopefully, progression of disease or fast progressors, different things that could help you there. Um, I was just at our Fort Worth site in, in Texas where they've actually used a, a augmented reality device, like we heard about, to do manufacturing online um, remote monitoring of, of processes in the manufacturing line. So. I think you can see the benefit from drug discovery with protein and AI um, activities there to clinical development trials to, to end stage manufacturing things. So yeah. I think we're really trying to use it across the spectrum. Again, it's how do you implement that? And uh, you know, really, again, thinking about what do you have to show those sort of value stories that are going to be important mm -hmm. in, in having uptake. Daniela, mm -hmm. how are you using it at Chenetech? It's along the same lines. I think AI will change clinical development uh, fundamentally. And, for the very reason that we can't take 10 years, 15 years to fail a molecule. We have to fail faster. And we can use uh, AI in a way to interpret complex data, just like Joe said, all the way in, in our life cycle and in, in, in clinical development programs, we can select patients better. We can um, design smaller trials, faster trials. We can uh, give more power to a trial with less patients. We can interpret data at the end and then uh, make that translational medicine goes much faster and we learn fast, fail fast. But, may, but, but how is the FDA going to look at that? And so that if you've got a deep learning algorithm that you don't even understand, but it's curating the data on the patients getting into your trial, how does that go on a label? This okay. drug is approved for the patients who deep learning says do well with it. How, how do you, how, what, I guess, what's the feedback from the FDA on this right now? We're discussing right now, right? We, we as a field, we're learning how, how that's going to be incorporated. But taking a step back and thinking about this is just a new technology, but we are used to use new technologies all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, traditional drug development, we select patients for a trial. There is very specific inclusion exclusion criteria that's based in imaging and other uh, well-known biomarkers. So um, in a way, you can think that you can incorporate AI in a meaningful, responsible way that you don't lose control of the output and you can gate your output based on well-known decisions. Now, again, the caveat is deep learning is a black box. So we it's also have box. to overcome right. the, the black box paradigm. <laughs> Any other comments? Yeah, I mean, Jay, you use AI every day. We sure do. And how do you use it? <laughs> well, you look at a patient and you think to yourself, this patient is diabetic. Uh, they might develop proliferative disease. Do I want to see them in three months, six months, 12 months, or two years? And you do that based upon all the data you have in front of you, the OCT, the fluorescein. You look at their biochemical profiles. You do that. But that's a poor man's way of doing it. And we've actually worked with actually Jill prior at Genentech and now with Daniela to develop algorithms where I can predict with, with their, uh, in collaboration with their algorithm, who's going to develop proliferative diabetic retinopathy in the next year.
And so now I can inform it because I'm re-embedding it back into the EMR, which clinicians love so much, mm -hmm. uh, a risk factor score progression where I can say, this patient has a 50% risk of proliferative disease next year. What do you want to do? When do you want to see this patient? And that's going to make, I think, our lives a little bit easier as clinicians. When we're seeing high volume patients with very complex diseases and very different biochemical profiles, being able to apply them and say, in realistic fashion, we want to prevent the progression of disease because that can be obviously life affecting and costly to the insurance companies and potentially uh, quality of life indicated for the patient that's going to decline. So we're going to use this, I think, rather rapidly in the future. And that's a really easy entry point for a lot of people. If we phenomenon. put it into an EMR, though, do we have to show that it is better than standard of care? No. Uh, or it's not going to be something that the FDA or it's going to regulate? No, this is like an actuary table. Hmm. Insurance companies use it all the time to figure out what your chance of dying is. Of course, no television would say, well, let's just give the patient a machine and monitor them at home, and then we don't even need your algorithm, <laughs> right? And they just well, come, in, it, come in the day before they're about to bleed, and we'll laser if them. If it was as simple as that and home OCT was going to predict everyone, I think that that would be a, a reality. But fortunately, a lot of these, these are systemic diseases. And they beyond you know just the A and B patients. There are other conditions that are far more complex than we all determine. So, uh, knowing that we have an OCT that we just heard about today that has an AI algorithm that can show you fluid, how soon do you think we clinicians are going to have that in our OCTs that we use in the office every day, so that we're not reading them anymore? Patient goes in, gets the test, they come out with a piece of paper that says, wet macular degeneration, this much fluid, I suggest an injection. Is that coming? It's, it's going to, so I think that the idea of automated reading is going to be embedded within software within mm -hmm. the next yeah. year. Yeah. And who's, who's going to own those algorithms? See, that's where I was going earlier, is that does every OCT company have to develop their own algorithms, or can we export the raw data? and use a single center to evaluate it, we can do that. We heard Bionics does it in real time. We don't even need a one to two second cloud delay. The unfortunate so thing who is- who owns the data and well, who owns the algorithm? Uh, let me just step back for a moment. Okay. So the, the first question around algorithm, everyone has an algorithm. I mean, mm -hmm. every mom and pop will make an algorithm. <laughs> right? And actually, the uh, I'm on the AO committee and we're putting in, putting in a, a learning lab where we have data sets that are going to be available for people to create their own algorithms from that. So they'll have OCT data, they'll have fundus data. That's going live in November where clinicians, anyone, people, any person who's part of the AO can actually go and develop their own AI algorithm to do, do disease detection. It's coming out of the radiology platforms that have been there. The, the issue is how good of, of a performance are they? Um, and many of them are quite equivocal in their performance mm -hmm. values. The bottom line is, though, the clinician does poorer compared to the instrument with regards to disease detection. And this has been shown actually in a recent study by the NEI, where the sensitivity was much higher with the algorithm than it was with clinicians, especially when there was fluid, internal mm -hmm. fluid in those patients. And that's disease altering, right? That's right. how we know that those patients do worse if they have internal fluid. So. It's going to be a, uh, definitely like a uh, ability or just an enabler for us to do a better job as clinicians. And I love that slide that was presented with all those three sort of areas where it's going to work. It's really going to be a guidance system for us, I think, as clinicians. Right. So uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to ask each of you this, but Jill, you first. What are you most excited about AI, you personally, and your field? And as a clinician, what should I be most excited about? I am excited about it really transforming. I think, you know, Daniela said it well, the, the time it takes currently to develop a drug, the fact that we could have tools that could completely disrupt that, I think is really exciting. It's better treatments faster to patients who need them. And I think you should be excited about that too. I'm also <laughs> really excited about just, just this sort of clinical decision support, like the fact that our human brain cannot manage the amount of data we would have every day in our clinic. And the fact that it could be, you know, given to, I think it was you, Daniel, that coined the term, you know, sort of reading center in your pocket. Like if you could have something that could just, you know, influence and impact the way you make your decisions, I think would be, would be tremendous. Daniela, you can answer it the same way if you like, or go in another yes, direction. Yes, and, and you and I have been working so closely in this for so many years, but we are already experiencing the first wave of benefits of AI, which is what Rishi said, is efficiency and reliability. And we're going to allow many more 
ophthalmologists and even physicians to be as good as the best possible retina specialist. And AI doesn't get tired or worried or hungry, and we're just going <laughs> to harmonize Oh, it gets hungry, but on efficiency. a different level. <laughs> Now, There's the, somebody behind that AI <laughs> that is... For know. sure. Well, anyways, yeah. um, the big advantage, though, and that's what excites me the most and scares me the most, again, um, is when we will need to deal with um, algorithms that predict the future. And we're going to run an algorithm today and ask what's going to happen to this eye in a year from now. And I'll need to act mm -hmm. on that output. And I think that's going to be where we're going to be mostly responsible and thoughtful, how we're going to build those predictions. But And, and that's where we're those. really going to have to show that there's the algorithm is correct and there's a benefit. Exactly. Rishi, you get the last word. Uh, it's For me, it's disease personalization. We look at patients all the time and we have no idea if we have to treat them six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, what we get. And, uh, you know, we are in the dark ages of what we do right now for treatment. We are OCT cosmetologists. We make the OCT look beautiful at the best hope that that restores vision. And that, to me, is, is really where I think the value of these technologies come in because we can personalize it and figure it out from the baseline and really figure out and have a really frank conversation with the patient about what their projected changes might be over time. Well, thank you all. Yeah. Thank, you know, thank you so for listening. Much. Thank you.